let's see if that sound okay, sounds okay. Oh man, thousand times. Okay. Better. And I've been recording this the whole time. So if ever in the future do I want to do a B roll, <laughs> I got I got footage for a B roll. Well, I tell you, I'm going to say like 15 little prayers in my head that that doesn't happen again. <laughs> so we're ready. <laughs> you're pretty popular. You know, I think I know what it is. No. You're just such a good guy. Like you have this, you you have a good energy about you that people just want to connect with. Yeah. I'm I'm more like off-putting, yeah. where somebody's like, mm, I don't want to deal with that guy. You know what I mean? You're the you're the real <laughs> deal. Welcome to the EBFC Show, the easier, better for construction podcast. I'm your host Felipe Engineer Manriquez. This show is all about the business of construction. Today's episode is sponsored by Construction Accelerator. The design and construction industries come up with and build great things, but we also build in waste in how we do those things, in our interactions, in our contracts, in our logistics. So what does this do for our bottom line or our next project? The best firms maximize their value by removing that waste and only doing what's essential to the work, what makes them money. Construction Accelerator will train you to see the waste and give your teams the lean tools and experience to remove it immediately. All online, Construction Accelerator is made up of three to nine minute videos that can be watched again and again in the field, at the office, and at home, all broken down by topic. Need to learn pool planning? We have videos on the process, how to set up a room, and how to kick off a team. Need to set up a target value delivery project? We discuss all the aspects of TVD, especially cost. Or maybe you just need to brush up on 5S. Well, we have videos on that as well. You can download and print reference materials to use on site to immediately translate watching into doing. Subscribe today at tricanow.com. Let's build an industry, not just a project. Today's show is also sponsored by the Lean Construction Institute. LCI is working to lead the building industry and transforming its practices and culture. Its vision is to create a healthy and thriving industry that delivers outstanding project outcomes every time for everyone. Check the show notes for more information. Now, to the show. Well, I always tell people, like, you, I come at it, I've been hurt so bad in my past in, in the industry. So that's where I come from with, like, real empathy for people that I work with and Luckily, it does come across. And does that go back to like the difference between sympathy and empathy? Where like sympathy is, wow, you're, that's a tough, tough time, and empathy is, I'll go there with you. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. In <laughs> fact, the podcast episode on my end, I'm going to title it "Everyone Loves Felipe." <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, Jason. I like that. I don't know about Jason's show, but I would love to have more comments to react to. So come on, bring it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I get most of my comments either uh, LinkedIn direct messaging or email. Um, and, and I, it, yeah, it's, you know, and, and somebody said, you know, I listen to the podcast. I'm sure this happens to you, but, but when you say share it or comment, that doesn't register, you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> Yeah. And so I, I did a little part in the podcast the other day about how the LinkedIn algorithms work. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's not about popularity. It's about sharing, but I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise it's just us yammering on when we could be answering questions. Right. Absolutely. Like we're here to serve. And I think that's something that you and I definitely have in common. I saw that early in, in the videos that you were doing. I was like, Oh, Jason is into, I think LinkedIn actually served you my way because we have some similarities in what you're doing. And I mean, we're both in construction, duh, but there's 11 million people in construction in the United States. So that wasn't the only thing. Welcome to the show, Jason Schroeder. Jason is a longtime LinkedIn friend. We met on social media. Thanks to the pandemic, it's brought us closer together. So we've become fast friends over the last year. Super happy to have you here, Jason. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day. And I'm robbing you from your family right now to be with me selfishly to share with the industry what's going on. Jason, please say hello and tell everybody a little bit about who is Jason Schroeder. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me on. I know that sounds kind of cliche, but really, thank you for having me on. <laughs> and uh, so the ba the most important thing about me is I'm Felipe's number one fan, like just just 100 <laughs> percent. <laughs> so I, I, uh, so I'm a, a husband and a father of 11. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I just started Elevate Construction. I'm passionate about changing the industry. That's not, you know, I hear, I hear that a lot. You know, I want to change the industry and I think people are sincere about it, but literally 
I'm, I'm absolutely disgusted at the way we treat workers in this industry. And I feel like the progress will come from trained leaders and that families will be more balanced and healthy because of it. And so my vision is to work with people like you. That's why I said I'm your number one fan to work with people like mm -hmm. you to change this industry from coast to coast. And that's why the podcast is called Elevate Construction. I want people to have a fun, wonderful experience. And, and uh, I'm on this Facebook um, group, I think is what you call it. Construction superintendents. That yeah, right. yeah, and it's, uh, construction superintendents, and and somebody said in the in the chat there, uh, and and posted a message. I'm a new superintendent construction. What advice would you give me? And you know, post after post <laughs> after post was get out. Don't do it. Don't you know? You, don't ruin your life. Become a project manager. And I'm like, no, no. Construction can be fun. We know how to do it yeah. right. Let's get it done right. So that's that's a little bit about me. That's amazing. And yeah, for those of you that don't know, we'll put links to Jason's podcast in the show notes to make sure you check that out. I'm subscribed on iTunes, and I'm sure you can get it on many, many places. Right, Jason? Yep. You can get it on Spotify and and SoundCloud and and Apple and all of those all those uh, podcast platforms. In fact, I stole two of them from you, so I had my my oh, my producer awesome. add those two, so you can get it anywhere you want. <laughs> yeah, Castbox for those in the United States that don't know is the number one podcast platform outside of the United States. What brought me to asking you to come on to the show, and I definitely asked you, and, and you said yes without hesitation, I appreciate that, is that uh, you are working to change the industry, and it happens with increasing awareness. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm going to have Jason's link uh, for his LinkedIn profile down below as well. You should follow Jason Schroeder. The content that he puts out on LinkedIn is game-changing. Like, it's, number one, it elevates my day. Like I see the videos that you have and you put them out and you can't put out enough for me. I'm always, when I see them hit, I get the notification. I'm like, I got to check out this next video from Jason. The one recently that I remember that I really was like laughing out loud was the one about porta potties. And uh, could you tell people what was the inspiration for that uh, post? The, the inspiration, well... <laughs> I, I was, uh, you kick me on the heel if I go to talking too long, but I, w I flew to Florida and was doing some consulting with the, uh, a group in Florida. And I was walking a big $360 million project with this really high profile general superintendent. And he was showing me where they were excavating for spot footings and they had done their control and they had this big, you know, just all everything about the job and really impressed. And he was showing me his trailers. And then a worker walked up and said, Hey, you know, just kind of tugged him on the arm. This was before COVID-19 and said, Hey, just so you know, none of these bathrooms have toilet paper. And he took, he looked over, no, no, sorry. He looked at the worker and he was like, okay, I'll get somebody on that. Like really kind of, you know, curt and rude. And he looked back at me mm -hmm. and he's like, he started telling me about the building. And I'm like, well, hold on, hold on. Like, time out. No. <laughs> we need to go cut up our shirts or go to Walmart <laughs> or we need to do something. We cannot do this. Yes. And, and I just feel like I, I keep saying we have a problem in construction. Our productivity is not getting better. And people will argue, well, it's not that bad. It's not this. And then my point is, and this is, this is answering your question. Okay, I can prove to you that we don't have respect in construction and that we still aren't making progress. And I can tell you one word bathrooms <laughs> and then yeah. and then like it, a light bulb goes on and people associate this concept and they realize oh yeah like we treat our workers like animals and really when you think about it like it's no different than if you're you know we go look at it's different don't let me be dramatic but like if we go look at slave labor and you know in like the middle east or in a third world country or something and we look at their conditions it's not too long of a stretch from a mental, you know, treatment standpoint with some of the conditions mm -hmm. that we put our workers in, not able to wash hands, no, no clean bathrooms, not even a place to eat lunch, uh, disrespectful conditions, dirt, dirtiness everywhere. And that's why to me, lean is heaven. And our current condition is, I, you might have to bleep this out, but it's like hell, <laughs> like the place yeah. I'm not cussing, but like, so here we, here we yeah. have these two opposite ends of the spectrum. And my proof of concept that there's a gap there is bathrooms. I think that post exploded. Yeah. And if I could have liked it 10,000 times on LinkedIn, I would have. Well, I appreciate <laughs> it. That I've definitely, Jason, I've seen that. It's so true. It's that little thing that shows people's real belief about the work face. And I remember people, you know, in direct labor, and I've been in the construction industry myself for over 20 years. 
and just most of the time working for general contractors that had offices on site. So only once that I worked for a little bit where we were remote and not right on the site. So I had to use Porter Johns my entire career. I know exactly what you're talking about. And then, and we didn't, it's not like the general contractor had special Porter Johns for us. I mean, sometimes they did, but typically we had the same exact Porta Johns that the workers had. And, and you know, it's 30 degrees below zero and we're trying to make something happen uh, in these types of conditions. It's insane what we're doing to ourselves. And then, and the, the, if you take the time to even listen to the vendors that sell that type of stuff, they'll tell you like, we have these like run of the mill and then we have, there's levels of bathrooms mm -hmm. that are, have been available since portable bathrooms have been around I agree. and people just don't take advantage of it or even think like, what message am I sending to my employees? What message am I sending to this crew? That's something that is so small yet so big. I agree. And I, th I think heaven's the right term. Like, I'm right there with you, man. Like, if we're out of paper everywhere, I'm ready to cut my shirt up too because nothing is worse than <laughs> trying to work, especially in hard conditions, and you can't take care of, like, number one or number two. I agree. Puns in time. I agree. You know, and I, I when you did the uh, Lean Blog presentation about uh, 5S, I, I really appreciated it because of the enthusiasm and the participation, the total participation of your workers. Those kinds of environments, I just feel like they're just fantastic. And if I can tell you a quick story. Yeah, please do. Tell me a long story. So I was on a project with some with a fantastic team. Uh, and at the end of the project, we, we ended up winning awards in ENR for it because of safety. At the beginning, it didn't start out like that the the restrooms you know graffiti everywhere not well taken mm -hmm. care of 40 things a day you know how you put on your safety glasses hey please do this hey 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 not really just bad attitudes people not bought in and i mentally and i think that's where we go in construction um if i was to speak for you know just the general population i was like we really got to fix this you know what i mean like we it, i'm going to station somebody yeah. out there i'm going to hire a guard or i'm going to get the half porta potty so we can just all kinds of punitive stuff and then i feel like it was inspiration honestly i feel like you know god was helping me with this but it, and i i had started reading two second lean so maybe the inspiration came from lean but I thought, yeah, we might give Paul, we'll give Paul a little bit of credit for inspiring yeah. <laughs> I, Yeah, it, that's a whole other podcast. But the, the thought came to me, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's make a deal with these, these wonderful workers, these, these, these skilled craftsmen and women. So literally, this is exactly how it happened, came and talked to the general superintendent. Uh, I was over the interiors and site work and a number of other things on that pro big project. And I said, let's make a deal with them. Let's build bathrooms on level one and level three. And let's trick them out, running water, nice lunchroom. Let's get them, you know, clean professionally every day. Let's start huddling the workers every day and let's make a deal. And so he was like, okay, I'll let you try that, Jason. He's, this guy's fantastic. In fact, um, mm -hmm. I, I did a podcast about him the other day, but he was like, yeah, let's do it. So we, we gathered all 210 workers. And I said, let's make a deal. Um, we're not treating each other with respect right now. We're going to build bathrooms. We're going to have extra toilet paper. We're going to have running water to wash your hands. Right. Nice lunch area. I'm even going to put signs up on the walls on how to change these things out. We're going to have you guys huddle on, on a daily basis. We're already huddling with our lean systems, our morning huddle. And we are going to go over and above and take care of you guys. And what I want from you is I want remarkable safety. I want you to clean up your areas, clean as you go. And I want you to really respect things and no more graffiti. Now, whoever doesn't agree with this deal, raise your hand. And nobody raised their hand. And immediately, no. immediately, the job switched overnight because we respected them. In fact, there's this, uh, uh, you know, age is a protected class, so I have to be careful. But there was this really, really... Uh, you know, seasoned old uh, uh, electrical foreman that came up and grabbed yeah. me by my shirt. Actually, a, a buddy of mine, Jake Smaley, and I, he grabbed us by, by the shirt and said, in 40 years, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, it proves that we don't have to be treated like animals. And that was the moment. That was, you know, like one of those connection moments that you were right. talking to me about. And, uh, you know, it, it almost brought me to tears, honestly. And from that moment on, I've just seen it differently that if we were, and you talk about this a lot is if we respect them, mm -hmm. they're going to give us 10 times, not that that's the point, but they're going to give us 10 times back in respect what we gave them. And it was remarkable. At least. 
I remember earlier in my career talking to a carpenter foreman and the way that he was talking, and I was just a young 20 something year old, you know, know it all punk kid. And, you know, with a stupid engineering degree, what did I know? And this carpenter foreman was like, he's been around the block and then some. He could do things that, you know, I still can't do around <laughs> my house. And I remember just the way he was talking, Jason, and he kept saying like them, them. And we were, we were talking, I was doing overhead punch list. This was like super early in my career. You know, it's, it's, you know, thankless work having to create a punch list. You're finding all the flaws for those of you who don't know what it is. Like there's ways to have a building turn over without a punch list. I know that now, but I didn't know that 20 years ago. And, and the, the carpenter foreman just kept talking about them. And then finally I said, who's them? It's like, I'm brand new. Who's them? He's like management, them <laughs> people in the trailer. And I was like, wow, because I had just been listening as I was going around and we're trying to clear items off the list. And there was like a lot of anger in his voice. And I just remember being that young, like, ooh, don't ever get on this guy's yeah. bad side because it's good. it could be rough. And and I remember I used to hang out because I was doing this punch list. I was in the field, Jason, you know, 10 hours a day. So I'd be out there with the trades all day long as I'm walking around and people would be friendly and talk to you if you were friendly back and you start to hear these stories and, and I'd see like, you know, at breaks or at lunch, there'd be like a separation between the people running work and the people doing the work, even among the the trades themselves. It wasn't always cohesive teams and you wouldn't see trades would not even together be together. There'd be like, you know, plumbers over here, drywallers over here. And even I was talking today to some mechanical contractors and there were still like a us versus them, like us versus the other trades type of thing. I'm like, who sets all that up? Yeah. Them. Them. Management. It's up to us. And that's why I really love what uh, the work that you're doing and taking that approach. And it started, you know, you had the epiphany yourself and you went and did something about it and you got the benefits. And like everybody else, I think you gave them hope for how can things be? And hopefully they, they can go to the next job and, and communicate that to the next team and and duplicate it again and have it again have a great experience every time yeah. i really agree with that and and uh you know this i i appreciate you having me on the podcast i'm not here to advertise or anything but when we talk about like our niche in the market what we're mm-hmm. doing you know how is is what felipe is doing and jason what what i'm doing tying together you hit it spot on I want to, and I'm going to use bold words. This is just who I am. And that's why mm-hmm. I said, you know, you're so much better at the connection than I am. But the, I, I we'll want see. to be, and I am right now in whatever sphere I'm able to, I'm the guy that says, do better, expect more, let's go. For workers, I, 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 I want to filter workers and foremen and field engineers and superintendents into all of the lean systems that you and LCI and the lean blog and all of you wonderful professionals are advocating and into these scrum systems that, that I've been learning more about with your influence. And mm. I, I want workers and foremen to not feel that learned hopelessness. And if I can just, uh, I'll tell you a long story here, <laughs> but in a, in, in yeah, a book, it. I can't remember which one it was. I can't remember if it was the power of habit or, or, uh, the culture code it, it, in one of those recent books that I read about culture, they talked about an experiment they did with German shepherds where, and this is cruel. I would never advocate this, but since they did this study, might as well learn from it. Um, they had one cage where they would just shock the German shepherds, the the, the dogs. Mm-hmm. They had another one where it was split half and half where they would shock one side and they would shock the, the second side or they would not shock the second side. So shock, no shock. And then the other one, where it, it was, there was no shock. And then they put all three of those cages into the shock, no shock cages. And the ones where they just received an electric shock, none of the dogs moved from the shock, from the shock side to the non-shock side. Same with the mixed cage, but the one, the German mm-hmm. shepherds where their original cage, where there was no electric shock, as soon as they got into the second cage, they all moved from the shock side to the non-shock side. And what they, what they hypothesized, what they felt like their findings were that, that animals and human beings can get this learned hopelessness. 
And I want to invite and encourage and love and mentor and call and podcast people out of the learned hopelessness into a, no, 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 no. We know. We know today. We know today how to run a perfectly clean, safe, organized, quality, lean project with total participation using collaborative agile systems for short interval scheduling that are remarkable. Like, please do not learn this hopelessness. That's what I do. And so you'll yeah. know the the lean definition better than I will. But my definition after hearing 50 of them, mine is respect for people, stable environments, and then continuous improvement. Because to me, at least with workers, foremen, field engineers, and supers and PMs, we yeah. can't continuously improve unless we have stable environments, stability, and, and some standardization. And then we can't standardize unless we respect people and improve our conditions. And so that I, I totally agree with you. I'm so passionate about it. And at the end of the day, I want to have large groups of people uh, in, in remarkable trainings, immersive trainings, pulling them out of their comfort zone. So they expect more hmm. and go into the systems that you teach about. I love that. That's a good, uh, I'm going to definitely take that and put it on my, my my page of praise I hope it does. <laughs> thank you jason <laughs> yeah and I, and I love your your definition of lean you have you've got the perfect sandwich of the the two things i always tell people like if you forget everything i say just remember one thing respect yourself more it'll be contagious to how you interact with other people and then if you want to go deeper then you can throw on continuous improvement or seeking perfection and what tell me one more time what your middle one was stable environments stability Stable environments, stability. Yeah. That's where the agilist to me is like, bring the chaos. We'll adapt. <laughs> well, and I might need to. Have, I might, we'll have a process for that, though. No, I, I totally agree. <laughs> and, and I'm going to ask you lots of questions about that. Maybe my definition is uh, is is wrong. I'm not talking about stabilized. No, no, no. I, I like well, it. well, let me let me give you a pushback here. Not on what your concept, but that maybe I, maybe I need to redefine it. Cause when I say respect for people, that's global, right? But stable environments right. to me is, you know, five S uh, cleanliness, organization, stability around the trailer, visual wayfinding signage, things like that. So that we okay. can, so that we can employ agile scheduling systems. So, so my stability maybe needs to be more focused on the environment. You know, there's this famous saying of people that uh, developed these systems long before us, Jason, that, if you try to improve where there's no standard in place, you're just creating more chaos. Yeah. yeah so you're doing, you're doing really well. I think that's a good mindset. And you, you, you touched off on like three out of the 14 total production system principles, but I'm not going to call them up. I know <laughs> <laughs> so good for you. I mean, they are timeless and they do absolutely help. And yes, everybody in construction, you can learn from manufacturing. I tell people too, and you know the same, like you talked about studying Charles Duhigg who wrote The Power of Habit and then the the culture book. Those are two things that were not made for people in design and construction. And yet here we are, we have those in common. We're learning from other industries to bring to our industry so that A, we can be more yes. effective and then B, we can inspire people to want to try and learn more things. I agree. I agree. And I feel like you and I have a, and I don't mean this to be bragging, but like what our perspective comes from, I feel is being able to pull from manufacturing and Paul and Patrick mm -hmm. Lencioni and all these people and pull them into our world of construction. It, Cause that, that's really what it comes down to is people will read, you know, they'll go to the AGC lean course or read two second lean or read the Toyota way or the, you know, lean thinking or whatever. And they're like, mm, I'm not sure how that applies, but, it's so applicable. And if we can make it even a little bit easier on folks, I think that's fantastic. Right. I mean, we have that hard job of meeting people exactly where they are and then journeying with them. It's like, come on, come with me. Let's go together. Yeah. You don't have to be by yourself. And if you want to be by yourself and trailblaze, go for it. I'll follow you for a little while too. I'll learn yeah. something. I'm down. I'm down. 100%. Yeah, no, I love it. I, I wanted to ask you too, like, you know, the, uh, the pace that you keep up on LinkedIn, I've definitely stolen some ideas from you for sure. Like <laughs> it's been, it's been great. I I've started thinking more about, you know, that engagement with folks. And I was telling, I was talking to a guy at our office here in California and he works in visualization. So it's, I mean, who would think, you know, 10 years ago that a construction company can have somebody that's dedicated hundred percent full time to creating visualizations, but we have it. We have it today in that's 2020 fantastic. 
And uh, his name is Andy. And Andy is like really good at what he does. And Andy and I were talking about, you know, why we do what we do. And we both agreed. Like if we just had one person paying attention to us and getting some benefit, that'd be enough for us to keep oh, doing yeah. 100%. it. Oh, yeah. 100%. And I see you in, in the same way. And and for those of you who are keeping score, Jason is kicking my butt. <laughs> On LinkedIn, he is far ahead of me. <laughs> and and rightfully so. It deserves the people that, that benefit from what you do and the engagement. I mean, you definitely leave us, Jason, better than we were. And like I said, that bathroom post, and you've had other posts too, where you, you make me think every time in the videos that you share, which is not like by default, because sometimes I'm not thinking. Like I'll say it right now, like I'm not thinking all the time. And and it, it's good because you see people engaging with the content and then you know that they're taking it back to yeah. their work. You mentioned on that 5S thing that I did for the Lean Construction blog, Danny and Manny were the two foremen that I got to hang out with, as well as I think it was Robert who was our safety coordinator on that project, in addition to the project manager, the concrete superintendent, some other folks, but but the two people that were leading the trades, I mean, the the takeaways, I still hold it near and dear right here. And I can remember it was Mandy told me, he said, I've been doing this for over two decades myself, and he's aging way better than yeah. I am. <laughs> and he said to me, he's like, no one's ever asked me, what do I yeah. think? And I told him, I was like, I put my hand on his shoulder. This was before COVID also. And I said, I'm so sorry that it's taken this long for somebody to ask you what you think. Because the whole time, the best ideas for how we can do what you're doing are going to come from you and the people doing it. Like occasionally we'll get the spark from being disconnected. But more often than not, like who's going to tell them better than they know? I totally agree. I totally agree. And and to your point, um, you know what gave me, and I hope it's not a big deal to mention a couple of really good companies. You know, I love, I, I no, love. No, go for it. You name anybody. You know, you I want. love McCarthy. I lo- I worked for DPR for four years. I love DPR. I love their culture uh, of lean. And um, the one thing that got me to see what you're seeing about scaling, and making it worthwhile, mm-hmm. and being able to connect. You know, even if it's just one person. Um, I had taken, and I hate that all these stories are about me, but that's all I know. But. Uh, Hey, this is your show, hey, Jason. I'm interviewing then on you. We, this is your time to on shine. On we go then. <laughs> the DPR had yeah. a had a training called PSPP, Planning, Scheduling, and Production Planning. Um, I did the Lean Core eight week course, the facilitated course, the AGC certification, and then read a ton of books. And there was something else I can't remember, but it all came together. Um, and I said, "We're going to just go try this on a job." And we did everything. And I was, you know, in our roles where we're bouncing around, we don't get to do much of that. Yeah. But that was the job where I was there 20, not 24. I was there every day. <laughs> I was there every day. We were able to implement it. It was great. And people would fly in to check it out, much like they do with you when you're, you know, you're touring people around. Mm-hmm. And then they took an idea. Let me give it to you, uh, which, which is not new. You know, we have roof kitting and room kitting and all mm-hmm. these kitting that, you know, procedures that we have in construction. We did room kitting where we coordinated everything in while in this laboratory and like Mm -hmm. literally everything. And we printed that lift drawing. It had a Revit background and then it had all of the blue beam markups from the trades and the lab consultant and the designers had reviewed it. So we laminated these and screwed them up on the wall. We didn't screw it up. We screwed them up on the wall. Yeah. The dra- you fastened yeah. them fastened to the wall. Them with- yeah. yeah. <laughs> For the non-English speakers, fasten to the yeah. wall <laughs> with adhesive like uh, No, well, they actually <laughs> use screws, but we put them, we put, the, we put these coordinated drawings on the wall and, and the inspectors and everyone roughed in from that because, you know, we all know whether it's medical or lab, there's equipment, architectural, mm-hmm. electrical, and everything shows different heights, right? It's, it's a mess. So we did that and we made people and it, it was made. And I'd love to talk about, talk to you about that, that sentence in a, in a, in another time, but we made people at the beginning until that was voluntary uh, we made them pre-cut and and prefabricate most of everything and then somebody toured the job and then all the way across the country i see a video that comes out where they took that and then they brought everything out in a little blue box like the little tupperware and uh, they had all the conduit wrapped up all the back boxes the the putty pads everything just right there and it had this little bill of materials and you they brought the box in and then it 
pre-kitted in because they, they they didn't get, have the time to bring in pods, right? Prefabricated rooms, yeah. and they, it was all there. And they they had a barcode system, they had a supply chain uh, management system for these little blue boxes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if we if somebody can just tour the job, Felipe's job, McCarthy's job, DPR's, Jason's job, and then they'll go scale it and sprinkle these on two or three jobs. There is hope that we're going to change this thing. And so, I that was a long story, but. I really do feel like if we can get people to see and feel and touch and taste some of the things we're experiencing, it can scale. So I totally agree with you. That comes right from what I learned when I studied Scrum, which is a management framework for pooling work. Like Last Planner System Production Control is very similar. They came out at the same time. And one of the the underlying things that makes Scrum work is this belief that Jeff Sutherland had with Ken Schwaber that every human being learns empirically. They have this empirical philosophy that you're going to learn and experience the world through your senses. And that that little subtle thing, I'm like, you know what, that is starkly different from a lot of other management systems and paradigms out there. Like, we've got to get people exposed so they can have these experiences and have these experimentations and, and you know, get go see something and experience it. And talk to the people that did it and listen from people that said, I was totally skeptical. No way is this going to work, right? And then they become you know, people that are sharing and proud to share the cool stuff that they're doing. I love that when people are proud of the work that they do. I agree. That's another, another cool thing that we have in our industry. Like everyone that's ever grown up in the construction industry has a parent, an uncle, an aunt, a mother, a father who's driven. You can't drive around the city and they don't point out to you the places that they had. a hand. I totally agree. Yeah. And that's something that's really cool. And you know, I'd like to, I'd like to have a discussion about that with you. Uh, um, you know, we, you and I have read two second lean probably multiple times. And I was on, an, yep. I was on a podcast interview the other day and I had mentioned that and I kind of, I'm not being a victim or, uh, too sensitive here, but I kind of got attacked a little bit. He was like, Oh, I do. I do not like Paul Akers. He's so arrogant. He thinks he knows. And I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, what, what just happened here? And and he he advocated Scrum, so I'm not going to tie Scrum to him. But he 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 and yeah. you started me down this path. So thankfully, I got diverted down a wonderful path. But I thought to myself, the reason I like Paul and some people, he's not for everybody, but I don't right. think he's arrogant. I've done a podcast interview with him. He's a very nice guy. He doesn't like to waste time, right? So he was pushing me to not waste his time. But what he is trying to do with all his heart, might, mind, and strength is just share videos and share this heaven that you and I experience. You know, lean makes life mm. worth living, right? In my mind. Yeah. And makes it better. And I've I've never found a better way to scale than to take before and after videos and to tour people through the the project site and get them addicted to showing that off. And so I'd love to hear what your thoughts are there because I love his systems. I didn't know if there was an industry theme in construction about the the pro and anti Paul Aker side of things. I don't know, but if anyone listening has been in a large corporation and been part of a rollout, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about, how those things typically tend to go. So some of the people were like, why I have a, a full-time job. Why is the company mandating that I read this book about a casework manufacturer yeah. who also makes like specialty niche things in the casework space, you know, based out of Washington and people just couldn't get past that it's not construction. Now, if you've studied culture or change management for even five seconds, you know that everybody and every construction project is a unique snowflake <laughs> and they're all different and special. And I always tell people like, yes, your project is special. And yes, you are unique, as am I. But the conditions that make us are well known. Yes. Like I know what it takes to make ice and snow. I know what it takes for a snowflake. I need certain conditions. And that environmental thing is something that we can control. Mm -hmm. Now, let's also agree that we don't know everything right now today that we totally need to agree. for tomorrow. Right? But some people don't think that, Jason. And they don't want to make the jump. Because you do mentally have to use creativity and imagination to read something like what Paul is doing and translate that into your your space. So part of that initiative, I was tapped in a job that I was doing, a hard bid job, design, bid, bill, traditional. And we had to organize, you know, using my my talents to get people to sit down and read this book with me. And I had to read it out loud to people, play Paul's videos because people weren't reading it on their own. 
And everybody didn't participate, and it's okay. But you know what? Almost everybody did. The vast majority yeah. did. And it was transformative for people. Like we had a super clean trailer all of a sudden. We had people, one of the we had a concrete foreman. He came into the office one day and he said, I've been on this job for a year. And all of a sudden, he's like, This trailer is different. I can't figure out what it is, but I like it. Mm-hmm. And things were like cleaner and organized. That was the difference. Yeah. And we had we had been inspired by what Paul wrote in his book. And I think there's always going to be people, and and Jeff talks about this in Scrum in the Red Book, you know, twice the work and half the time. We'll talk more about that. But a lot of people think that that's all about software. And in reality, Scrum was born in hardware, and it's got its roots in the military and Jeff's experience as a fighter mm-hmm. pilot. And people don't know that because... They have a day job. They don't necessarily have time to read. And they might be, you know, above, there might be at capacity. So a lot of, a lot of the people, and this is the the heartbeat of Paul's book is fix what bugs you is that's his main message. Like we can disagree with Paul on politics and religion and all kinds of things. And any human being, you can't, yeah. you're not going to agree on everything. Like just, that's not going to happen. Like my wife and I don't agree on everything. And somehow we're still magically been married for a long, long time. That's okay. Differences are interesting. It makes experiences interesting. So I think, you know, for for people that are anti that, some of it's just transferring that domain knowledge of something specific to their everyday world. And that takes like a good night's rest, creativity, space to be able to make things. Some people need permission to experiment. Some jobs are so under so much pressure, Jason, that they can't, take time to not do anything that they need to do every day because of what's happening on the job. The stress that uh, the people are facing out there is intense. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. And I know we have to get to another podcast here soon. So I'd like to just build on, on what you're saying there. Um, you know, I'm, I've, I'm a huge fan. I always have been of tact and, and also modified versions of, of last planner where it works throughout. And when scrum mm-hmm. came along, I, you're right. There are people that need permission. There are people that are busy. There are all, also people that need time, right? I'm pretty quick. I like to right. move quick and break things. Right. And I think, yeah, I think you too. do too. Yeah. So, so that's in our <laughs> strengths finder. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I do. That was, that was the start of this podcast, Jason. We almost broke this <laughs> podcasting recording system like four times just to get I'm started. I'm telling you. So, so, so that's who we are. And I appreciate your advice saying, hey, some people need time. At the end of the day, um, and I, nobody asked me for my opinion, but I'll give it. I, I, Jason, what's your opinion? I, thank you. I'm going to give you my opinion. I feel like sometimes we stop doing a PDA, PDCA cycle on our own lean tools and processes. For instance, and I'm, I have no, I, I take last planner and uh, I, with no shame, I modify it to my circumstances. And like, that's what I do. Like I, most people right. do morning huddles. I do afternoon foreman huddles. And then I spend the time with the workers in a worker huddle the next morning. I modify those systems. I focus more on roadblocks than I do PPC. I, I, without shame, modify that but I've been criticized so much for that. And they'll say, no, you have to do it the standard way. You have to do it the standard way. And I'm like, wait a minute, isn't this a lean system? Like, aren't we supposed to do a PDCA? And my, my main example is this. And some people would just say, Jason, you just don't, you just don't know what you're, what you're doing. And fine, like, fine. That's what, but if you go to every job that I go to, that's a huge hospital or a, a large laboratory or a mega project, the last planner system in its in its designed detail starts to break down in the interiors of the building because the scopes get so much there's so much so many activities and things like that and i'm not saying the process doesn't work i'm saying hey let's modify this in some instances let's also merge this with some tax planning and do some of those things and there's a way to put all of our standard areas kind of on a rhythm and then let's focus on our troublesome areas which which scrum tells it tells you to do right elevators absolutely elevators balancing stairwells you know this changeover over here let's manage with last planner or scrum these these areas and keep everything else on this flow right and people will like literally yell at me and i'm like 
we in the lean world can't, you know, just like Christianity adopted paganism, we can't have, you know, lean adopt our old fangled th fashioned ideas of just do it this way and without modification. I'm like, no, 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 time out. We need yeah. to modify. We need to be a little bit more adaptable, agile to use your words. Right. And, yeah. and so my, my concept would be like, I would love if the lean community would practice more PDCA and be more nimble and adaptable on the way we implement some of our tools because we have fantastic tools and, and, you know, we don't want to burn people out on the word lean or last planner or pull planning by saying, you have to use the template. Don't do anything else. Use the template. And then they're like, ah, I'm trashing the whole system when well, we can adapt it. So anyway, yeah. I'd love your thoughts on that. Uh, this would be one of those times where I got to smash that like button a thousand times. Like I do. We, we started uh, when I when I went into last planner system and like, you know, we we're talking in the beginning. I'm huge on context. I went back all the way back to Glenn Ballard's original thesis paper and read the almost 100 page paper where he's <laughs> codifying it for the first time. And I'm like, wow, I could really tell that this was written for academia. This was never meant for me to read. That's funny. <laughs> like never. And then I remember like, who is this Glenn Ballard person? And I started like talking to people in my network and I finally got connected with Glenn some years later. And I, I actually got to see him speak at a conference. And he said some stuff and we have actually become friends over time, but it started with a massive disagreement. And I told Glenn, like he even had, he has a committee or a group of people that are working on an update. And I, I spent a good year volunteering inside of that space, bringing some of these agile practices to last planner. And this is true for all lean tools. We need to iterate on mm, them. Yes. We have a standard. And you might have like a textbook, like people say, I've even had people on my show tell me that the way that we do last planner at our company is not textbook or standard. <laughs> and I'm like, what are the results on those projects? Are you on schedule or late? Well, no, you guys are ahead of schedule. Then what's the problem? Yeah. Can't argue results. What's the problem? Like you cannot forget why we do these things in the yes. first place. You're speaking my love people language. people sometimes forget that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why are we doing it? We're not doing it because we're going to get some last planner award. No such award exists. Yeah. It doesn't exist. Well, so don't try to do it. Don't do it for that sake. But to go back to what you said, like I, we look back at the Lean Construction Institute's standard work on last planner. It's 35 pages. I was like, we went through, I, I got a team together, 40 people, and we read through it all and we boiled it down to, based on our experiences with people like our combined effort. And I, I talked to uh, LCI's uh, director of education, Kristen Hill, who helped to put that together with a bunch of other people that probably, I think I remember Kristen telling me like 300 years combined of last planner experience. But like that thing has a date when it was published. Fast forward 10 years later, here we are. I bring, I brought 40 people together inside of my company where we had a combined probably only 100 years of total last planner experience, so not as much. And we got it down to just two pages. <laughs> and we, we got it down to a way that when we onboard our people, we're like, you know, the, the, the magical facilitator of this knows how to do it, has done it before, but we don't always have that. So we had to create a champion and we had to create a facilitator and there's roles for the two. And I said, I tell people when we onboard them in our company, Jason, that, my goal is that you will eventually be both. You will be the facilitator and the yeah. champion. And in construction, most often it's the superintendent, but not always. Yeah, correct. And then design, it can most it's most often a director or a design manager or design director, Agreed. or sometimes even an executive, depending on how big the job is. And somebody like myself might be the the facilitator for a while. It could even be a project manager, or sometimes it's been engineers. I've had many times project engineers that have good people skills. They can talk well and communicate. They've been amazing facilitators for Last Planner. And so, like, I say, like, here's the five connected conversations, and this is what it's based on. And I give them the whole, con more context than they probably want. And most people are like, just tell me how to make it work. And I say, like, okay, in the guide, you'll notice, Jason, the way we, if I had a picture of my guide, and it's published, it's online somewhere, um, there's a ton of white space. And I tell people that white space is intentional. It's not because we forgot to write stuff. That white space is for you to pick up the writing utensil of your choice <laughs> and write down how you will modify the system yeah. to suit your project needs. And then if you look at our guide, it's got a, a version on it. And I tell people the only reason I track that version 
is so that I make sure I blow the dust off of it and we keep changing it based on what we learn. And I've given that guide to people, Jason, and I said, you and your company, some of them trade partners, some of them architects, and even somebody at DPR and some other general contractors. And I said, you guys have been doing this for a long time. What would you add or change wow. to this? And I'm still waiting to get back somebody to say, you should do this differently. And I always tell people, like, and the people that promise me all the time are, are typically schedulers that say they've got ideas for how to change it. And I say, bring it. And I said, this is the way we change the guide. You do an experiment based on what you think after trying the standard. Mm -hmm. Experiment with what you think. Tell me how the results are and let's try yes. it. We'll try it together and experiment. And I was like, and if it works, we'll change it. And then I'll be responsible to go back to all the people that we've disseminated the guide to and tell them, here's an I update. Love that. So, but it's super easy. And I was like, anybody can change it. Anybody. I've got, I've got three promising people right now that are very likely going to give me a change. And I'm just waiting for the change to come. Like, I can't wait. I can't wait. And so far with our approach, Jason, every time that we've done it, we've improved the schedule by as little as two weeks, or we've maintained the schedule and added as much as $25 million worth of added scope and still delivered on the contract original yeah, schedule. I love it. So listen, ladies and gentlemen, a multi-year project schedule finishing on the same day with $25 million of added scope. That means we had to have gained time in order to do that much extra yeah. work. The system works. It has to be adapted with the team you have. And I tell people, like, there's five conversations to have. If we don't start on day one tracking PPC, that's okay. As long as the people are talking to each other and we're still learning in some way, shape, or yes. form, we'll iterate to PPC and variance tracking if it helps the team. Yeah, I agree. And don't get me started on weekly work plans, Jason, because I can I can talk for five hours on just that yeah. alone. Well, I think we ought to just keep this show going and talk. I'm going to talk to you about two other things, and I'll just use the last half if that's okay with you. Yeah, well, I know you want to talk to me about this right here. So, well, let's. Oh, not this one. This is what you want to talk to me about, right? Yeah. Well, let me let me first off say something that's going to make everyone mad. Um, see, we're not going to get where we need Do to it. go by just using CPM and three week look ahead printouts. <laughs> so um, we I just want to be on record for saying that. And I do want to say that I'm not the grumpy old superintendent that doesn't know how to use it. Um, you know, I, I've done the training. I'm P6 trained. I've built many, many schedules. I've used it. I know how to do it in and out. I know how to use Acumen. I know you how to use all of it. And we're not going to fix this industry right. just by doing CPM and three week look ahead schedules. It's not going to happen. So I'm going to, did you present, did right you on. present Scrum in 2017 at the LCI Congress in, um, in Anaheim or, or Southern California? Did you present there? I did. Okay. Standing room only. That's where I first started. Okay. So I went to your, uh, observed you doing that. And so all I took out from that, I, I didn't pay attention to it. I was presenting on some other stuff, but mm -hmm. I didn't pay attention to it. Like I said, so it, first of all, I, I apologize, but, but I saw, I saw the to do in progress and completed with the stickies. Yeah. And you saw something, something like this, yeah. right? Something this simple. Yeah. And, and so <laughs> ignorantly, I just said, Oh my gosh, you yeah. know what that would work great for? That would work great for, um, you know, power upgrades, uh, installing an MRI, uh, a complex area that yep. we have to finish. And so without even knowing Scrum, and I I, I, I misbranded it by calling it Scrum, but I, I would just get these big boards and we had these specific areas and start filling out stickies and we would just meet on it. And that and your presentation got me started that much on it. And, it, and I've been using yeah. that ignorant version for years now. Um, but here's my question. I love the book. I read it. Um, I read it. Yeah. Start to the book that, that Jason's talking about is this book right yeah. here. My, my favorite book by one of my mentors. I, I loved it. And I also like the little pokes about CPM that he gives in the book. <laughs> so, um, as he long, does. as long as we have, I get that we need milestones, but, but anyway, here, here, <laughs> I've been thinking about how to do this with functional areas, what we would typically consider our clusters in an integrated environment. You know, when you, we take it to the field and, and let's say a $170 million project, we have our functional areas. We'll split up that $170 million right. job into three real projects right 
my mind has been on fire of how do we implement Scrum in with the process to your point with people that want to do it, right? Not shoving it down their throat, but I want right. to know your thoughts on the ideal application of Scrum in construction. There you go. Bam. So let me, let's show a picture so that people can see. This is the entire framework here on screen. So I'm showing you've got a, a backlog and I teach uh, the Lean Construction Institute co-developed a class with one of, one of my friends, Claire, uh, who works at McCarthy and Stephanie, who works at uh, Rosen Electric with Kristen Hill's uh, blessing, help and participation. And we scrummed, Jason, we use scrum to make the class. Oh, wow. We scrum the class and I got pictures of it. It's in the, it's in the presentation. It's a two hour, very fun, highly charged, animated, hands-on. And, and in that presentation, I show here's the scrum framework. You can see all the parts of it. Uh, the only thing I need to add to this drawing is the goal. The goal happens right above the product owner's head. So, and to put it in last planner terms, I'm going to demystify it for free <laughs> since you asked me nicely. That's awesome. Backlog, backlog are all the things that we know we need to do in order to accomplish the project. Those are called milestones in last planner system. Sprint planning are the things that we're going to do now, this next phase of work. That's a phase pool, and we prioritize it to get the best sequence possible. Now, the difference in Scrum is we don't calendarize it and create that weekly work plan or look ahead schedule, but the sprint time box is when the team is pulling things off of that sprint planning or phase pool for those of you that speak last planner, and they're pulling it into one thing doing at a time, not multitasking. Now, they can work together if multiple people are working on the same thing. And the daily scrum is exactly like the daily huddle, except that it is 15 minutes or less. And you answer three standard questions. And I'm not going to even say what they are right now the second. In the review, you look at what the team actually got accomplished with the stakeholders. So that means in construction speak, it's done, done, all the way done. No takesies, backsies, no punch list. It's completely done, installed <laughs> right, or designed right, fully coordinated. So the next design team can use it and it's coordinated. Done means coordinated, ready for use. Next person in line can use it. In the retrospective, there we have that learning conversation like we do in Last Planner. You see all five conversations, should, can, will, did, learn, happening on this drawing. And in that class, I put the, the LPS parts right on there so people can see exactly where they are. Here, this is what happened. When they were developing LPS, Hal Makeover, a lot of people know who Hal is, he sent Kristen Hill to get trained as a scrum master. And then she brought that back as they were starting to make last planner system, something that can be taught out for the general public, you know, taking what Glenn and Greg did, Greg Howell, the two co-creators of last planner and make it a, a pool system like it was always meant to be. The two are very similar. And I've, I've had conversations with, with Jeff Sutherland as well. And I said, we have something very much like Scrum in the design and construction industry that also came out in the 1990s. Magical time, the 1990s. All kinds of cool stuff was coming out. And like a good boy in construction, I didn't realize that it was there until 20 years later. Because <laughs> that's how long it takes that's so for stuff to get to us almost. Right? So that's that's the full system. Now, to go to answering your question, like how would a team pick this up? The way that I understand last planner system, I had this told to me by a superintendent. I was on a project where the reason I was there was to do a last planner facilitation. And we do a little bit of onboarding. Now the project team knows Felipe is a scrum master. We want to learn scrum too. So we're going to do like a one hour. What is scrum? So I covered all the stuff that's here. And I told the team too, like, this is a good book. If you want more information, you know, pick up this book, but I'm going to cover here quickly in an hour. And there's even videos on YouTube that tells you the entire scrum framework in two minutes. Yep. So that but at the heart of it, it's a pool. It's a pool system designed to let you deliver value very fast, yeah. exponentially faster because it's got feedback loops built in. There's all kinds of good stuff and I do it better justice. If anybody wants to get deeper on Scrum, hit me up in the comments or message me. We'll talk more and I can point you to, to more resources even than just Jeff's Red Book. But teams can pick this up and use it with LPS. And the way, so the superintendent to go back here, we had done... It was the second time we were doing last planner facilitation with this particular superintendent. His name was Dan. And on his team, we were doing, we did scrum in the morning. And I was like, you know, animated, excited. This is before COVID. So we're all together in the same big room. 
And I'm like making noises and yelling and I'm, you know, talking smack on critical path schedules. Yeah. <laughs> so he comes out and, and he sits down and uh, he participates. And then we go through, like we get done, we take a short break, we do the last planner session with the trades. We pull six weeks out of the schedule like magic and just give it back to the superintendent as his float, you know, for the whole project team, not just his, but, you know, he can claim it. It's <laughs> his. He can have it. So we pull, we pulled the schedule in six weeks faster. That job finished two months ahead of schedule later. But that day, the superintendent said to me, he's like, I understood last planner system. I thought I did. But when I saw what you showed in Scrum with the pool system and then going through the facilitation with Last Planner, I really understood Last Planner better because of the Scrum training you gave me this morning. And I said, wow. No, I, I think you're spot on there. Um, and I I don't have all the terminology memorized off the top of my head like you do, but the, the point system for the activity, for the, the tasks, basically. Oh, yeah. Uh, th that says to me, right. let's not just keep the time, but let's gain time collaboratively together. It's almost right. like a and, and, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I guess my point. I was going to say, like, the velocity. Go ahead, Jason. I was just going to say. <laughs> We're both so excited. I know we are. I'm going to let you take it. No, I, no I, I think you're spot on because last planner, right, I think we just like with Christianity and paganism, that's just an example. I'm not getting political or religious, but, you know, you absorb this old system. I think yeah. last planner absorbs the old Gantt chart CPM system of, you know, not thinking about can we can we optimize this, right? Are we doing the most important right. things? Do we have total participation? And and so Last Planner just ends up being like a, a modified version of the same old thinking that we've had versus like you said, or the superintendent said, if you come from a scrum uh, background or, or, you know, understanding, then I think Last Planner becomes a we can gain on this schedule. We can still gain right. and have a flow. It Are we doing the most important things? And are we huddling together in proximity? I think that's such a good point, And I hope everyone gets that. I mean, fantastic. And now, now remember, I want to share something that Greg and Glenn told me, you know, when I was interviewing them and we were arguing about Last Planner in the early days when I still didn't know it as well as I do now. And they said they invented Last Planner system in response to critical path method schedules like we know today, Gantt charts. Mm -hmm. And they said they wanted the problem they were trying to solve when they first did it. And there's a, I think there's a great talk on YouTube that Greg does where he talks about this. The problem they were trying to solve is they're trying to make it easier for people to update and use CPM schedules. Yes. They weren't, they didn't set out to eliminate CPM schedules originally. Now later you can completely build a job without a CPM schedule. And I've talked to one of my friends at like the Project Production Institute, and there's a whole army of people that know that you can build a project, a complex project, a billion dollar plus a $10 billion job without a CPM schedule. Yes. It can be done. And people have done it. People have done it. Yeah. Shout out to you, Gary, if you're listening to my show. And, and I, Gary knows what I'm talking about. We have to get, we have to go do coffee or something to talk more and more about it. I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. When an owner tells me, uh, I want the V6 printout at a level four level of detail and, the, and then the <laughs> XCR file. I'm like, oh, for the love of all things, holy, like, do I have to go through this again? And, you know, I want day to day scheduling eight months from now. I'm like, we're professional guessers. Like, I guess that's all we're here to do. <laughs> we and 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 so I totally agree. And when I look at the system, I don't want to oversimplify it, but some of the because I feel like whether it's milestones and scrum milestones and last planner and scrum or whatever, or tact planning, I do believe, and I know yeah. for a fact we can run a job and they do it, in, you know, overseas and a lot of different places. They run an entire yeah. project without CPM totally bought in when I, right. a response to CPM for me so that we avoided crash landings. The step one was to start with a tact plan. I'm not, I'm not preaching this or advocating. I'm just saying where my mind is so you can help me with the scrum piece. Okay. We've started with the tact plan to show realistically what's it going to take? What's the end date? Like it's, let's at least identify the end date and not have that 20% difference between what we can sell and what we can actually build. Let's just start there and let's make sure CPM right. doesn't, you know, do a forward and backward pass and run your flow like this backwards and forwards and backwards. Let's make sure at least you have mm -hmm. a realistic flow, right? And then 
right. there are areas that run nicely on tact, I usually leave them in those modified systems and then focus last planner or scrum, whether you want to say from the critical path or, or you want to not say it like that, but the most critical items. I see Scrum coming sure. in. I could see a functional team saying, here's the overall project following nicely this tax plan, but this the elevators, the MRI, the electrical upgrades, we've got three Scrum teams. I, I, I'm probably using the terminology wrong, but we got three Scrum teams working daily no, that's right. to advance that and to advance on that, whereas the old critical path was like, oh, that's my critical path. I'm not going to do anything about it, but that's my critical path. I can see it. You know what I mean? I feel like scrum is the answer. <laughs> scrum is the answer to how do you attack your most critical path? And, and so I'd like, I'd like you to co uh, coach me, criticize me. Am I off base on us being, yeah. being able to use scrum to really focus and optimize on our most critical portions of the job? Is that off base? That's the same question that uh, people, I, I have some friends now at scrum Inc, the Jeff's consulting company and, and we were on a call, we had 50 people on the call, and I got asked that same question. And I said, so far, I've been using Scrum for over half a decade. I have yet to find where it doesn't work. And I said, I'm trying. I said, I'm trying for you, Jeff, to find where it doesn't work. <laughs> but so far, everywhere we've tried it, it's worked. Yeah. And it's helped people to deliver faster with less effort. Uh, the key is, like, the, you need a person that really knows the process. And in the Scrum framework, that's the Scrum master. And, and it doesn't have to have that name. Like there's even uh, Scrum for education and in the education system in that adaptation uh, spearheaded by a guy named Willie Wygans out of, he's in the book, he's in Jeff's Red Book. He's on that section about Scrum used elsewhere okay. where he transformed an entire school system. They Today they call the Scrum Master team captain. So for those of you, it's just imagine what a team captain does. A team captain uh, for most sports actually plays, whereas a coach doesn't play. So a team captain plays in the game with the team. A good scrum master plays in the game with their team. I mean, there are some scrum masters that full-time do that, and they don't actually do what the team does. That that exists. That's out yeah. there, too. But think in construction, the teams that we already have, and they are teams. You have a team that's doing just change order work. You have a team that's just doing TI. You have a specialty team that's energizing a building. And you, it might be, it's more than just the electrician. There are other trades, believe it or not, electricians that help you to energize a building. If you didn't have four walls yeah. <laughs> or, you know, and it's something to stand on, you need a building too. And like, there's all kinds of good jokes about that, that I'm not doing justice to, but it can be used, Jason, a hundred percent. It can, I have not seen where it can't. And we see now with a lot of the, uh, the integrated project delivery teams that are doing target value delivery. Yeah. That's a mouthful. The IPD teams doing TV, TVD. They use Scrum in their cluster groups or what they, some teams call project implementation teams. And they're just not, they don't know that they're using Scrum. And, and they're not. They're using a lot of aspects and parts and pieces. It's only a couple more things to do. Scrum, as by design, is supposed to be the smallest amount of management bureaucracy possible yeah. to enable team workflow so that you can deliver value. It only has 11 rules. That's it. In 11 steps, you can nail it. They don't even say 11 rules. They say three, five, three, three rolls, five artifacts, and, uh, well, I'm going to draw a blink. That's what happens when you work, you know, from <laughs> six in the morning. Here, let me, let me phone a friend. Here we go. So we have uh, three rolls, five events, and three artifacts. That's the three, five, three of Scrum. Here, I'll edit that to make it look I've got to have this graph. Three rolls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three roles, and this is for my friends at Scrum Inc. Three roles, five events. Five events are just five meetings. Five meetings and three artifacts are three things that we can see to help us. So a lot of teams that are doing TVD, you know, they might have, everyone's got their own title. So the titles are all over the place. So they're on the team. Yep. Do they have these five meetings, right? So the five meetings are right there. Uh, arguably, they have most of them. Yeah. A lot of teams don't look at, you know, they don't plan enough to see like what's coming down the pike. And that's where that backlog is so critical that helps teams propel forward. And then the retrospective is also special because I just did one today with an IPD team in Colorado, Jason. You would have been so proud. I ran it just like a scrum retrospective. Oh, man, that's awesome. We asked people like, you know, what's working well, what's not working. And I said, in order for this not to be talk, we have to look at what experiments are we going to do to change the things that aren't working? And people are like, what do you mean? I was like, don't worry, we'll do it together. 
So we identified like five things and we ended up having seven experiments. And I just got an email not even two hours ago from the team saying, here are the seven experiments. This is the first one we're going to do. And I said, oh man, it's working. That's awesome. They're, they're going to learn together. And it was awesome. And like, they're getting that much closer to doing Scrum. And I've, I've worked with teams in design construction, doing Scrum, over 10,000 individuals and teams and counting. But this is these are the things that you need. And and Scrum is meant to be iterated on. You don't have to start on day one with the 353, your certified Scrum master. You don't have to start that way. If you're not doing a daily huddle right now, start with a daily yeah. huddle. That's a super easy place to start. So if you're, because you're going to ask me like, what do I expect somebody to do based on what I'm showing here? Like number one, let's create flow. Make a simple backlog to do doing and done list, just like Jason did. When he, when he came to my presentation in 2017, look at it. It's 2020, Jason. We're still talking about Scrum. Yeah. That stickiness means it works. It works. It's working. It's sticky. It, like you want to do it. When you do this, Jason, you saw with your teams going after hard work, you were able to let work flow. It enables flow. It's visual. Just like we learned. Jeff told me, he said, one of the most important things for people to understand how Scrum works is they need to understand lean. He said that. Just like two months ago, he's like, Felipe, people need to understand lean better so that they can have really good scrum. Yeah. You know, and and, and so like, that, that's another book. I just want to plug, you know, this book, two authors here. This is lean. This really talks about in a meaningful, easy to understand way, how to improve flow on your projects. I highly recommend this book. And and this book has been used in many industries, including uh, healthcare. But was, there's a lot of construction examples. This is written for construction people. Yeah. So check this book out. This is Lean. Uh, you know, check out the Red Book if you want to learn more, and definitely subscribe to Jason's podcast, my podcast. Hello, <laughs> and you know, just in case you're like, how do I stay in touch with you, Felipe? Well, I'm gonna just make it visual, just like we do on Scrum. You can get me here, you can get me here, or you can subscribe to the podcast. It's on YouTube too. If you like this video and you don't want to listen to it while you're driving, check it out right there. Many ways to consume. Because we want to make it visual, make it easy to get people engaged and have some great experiences. Right, Jason? Right. Totally agree. And in fact, uh, th this is Lean. I've direct messaged on LinkedIn the authors two or three times asking them for permission to record it on audio <laughs> so I can send it to people <laughs> with no to no avail. But it's mm -hmm. uh, it's it is fantastic. And and I, I I'll give you some commitments. I will I'll take the Scrum Master training after I read the book that you recommended. Uh, when we in pre-construction, I'm do, using Scrum now, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be a mainstay in everything I do. It's fantastic, and so you've uh, you've changed a, yeah. a, a portion of my life to make it more remarkable and faster, relevant, and uh, and just thank you. You're welcome. That's what uh, that's what I do, and like and just like Jeff, and for those of you that don't know, Jeff gave the framework with Ken Schwaber, the co-creator of Scrum. It's free. It's in the public domain. Like we'll put a link to the Scrum Guide in the show description. So if you want to read, and there's even an audible version of the Scrum Guide, Jason, so you can listen to somebody read it. Yeah, too. I just, well, I just, <laughs> I'm going to send you a flash drive and just ask you to download everything. <laughs> do you, do, do you have time for one more question before we close out? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So I want to touch briefly on the, you did this in the Lean blog, which I thought was fantastic. You repeated which is appropriate, you know, Patrick Lencioni says you have to repeat it over and over and over for people to get it. You repeated probably 30 different times. You can't force, you have to do it when people want it. And so here's what I'd like right. to share, because I'm going to use the latter, latter half of this audio on my podcast. You can split the, you can use the whole thing on yours or whatever, but I, <laughs> I really want to yeah, know, I will, I want to know, uh, your thoughts on that so we have a deeper understanding and can learn from some of your pain points that you mentioned also knowing that i'm kind of a bull in the china shop i'm more of the you know dean graziosi says marketing is about re repelling people that that don't like your brand and attracting those that do the people that like me are the ones that want to go yeah. fast break things they want to be pulled out of their comfort zone I must and will and commit to having more connection like you do to everyone by focusing on when they're ready and asking for it. So would you talk a little bit about that before we close out? Yeah, absolutely. So I learned that lesson the hard way, Jason. Uh, when I first got into this, I was, uh, you know, working over 100 hours a week, seven days a week, 
I was on a classic trajectory to burnout. And there was a, a director had given a presentation and he said, uh, he shared all these lean manufacturing things and the people, you know, back in those days, it was the, you know, late two thousands, they just weren't interested because we were a successful company at the time. We were doing just fine. And here's this person trying to show us a different way to do things. And people are like, no, nah, we're going to resist that. There's some good things there, but he hit me just at the right time. He said, uh, at the end of the talk, he'd showed like these examples. He had some of the people from his projects talk. And the one thing that I saw in the people that were working on his jobs is that a, they were all happy. And I was like, and they didn't, and B, none of them looked tired. And I was drinking at the time, like I, I lose track, but I think it was like a cup 13 or cup 14 of coffee to stay awake after working, you know, the past seven days and then coming in for an all day conference and sitting down. It's tough to work all day and put that kind of hours in and sit still. Mm. It's really tough. Like you see people in the construction industry. I've even heard this from people helping LCI with their annual Congress. The hotel people tell me never in the history of any conference we've ever done has anyone drunk as much coffee as people in the construction industry. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? That's funny. <laughs> it's like we work a lot of hours. So I, I went up to the gentleman. His name was Mike. After his talk, and I said, Mike, something is going on here. Like. I don't know what it is. I want in on it. And he said, Felipe, you have to read a book to, to we have a little wow. group that we get together. And if you understand, if you want to understand what we're talking about, you have to read a book. And I said, no, I'm not going to read a book. I told him, no, I'm not reading it. And he said to me, he's like, okay, you don't have to. He's like, but then you can't join. <laughs> and he said, or you can join. He said, and then he said, well, he's a really nice guy. He said, or you can join. But you just don't, you won't know what we're talking about. And he's like, I want you to join and be successful. And then, and then he talked to me about, he's like, I've heard that you do good work, but it looks like you work a lot of yeah. hours. And he said, he's like, what does your family think about mm. that? And I said, okay, Mike, you got me. What's the name of the book? <laughs> and I got, I got the book, you know, that, that night I went home and ordered it. I didn't have, you know, any kind of cool app on my phone at the time. So I had to go home and order it the old-fashioned way. And the book was Lean Thinking by Womack and Jones, which, again, is not a construction book. Yeah. It's an outside. And in the first chapter of that book, Womack beautifully talks about three different things, value, non-value add, and pure waste. And with those three concepts alone and talking to the people in this group, within two weeks, I gained 40 hours back of my wow. life. I stopped working nights and weekends and it only happened because he hit me at exactly the right time with exactly the right question that would make me do something different. He interrupted my habits. So when I tell people, and he wasn't enthusiastic, like he was not, he will not go down in the history for being a great public speaker. Like he's not, he doesn't have any TED talks okay. and he's since doesn't even work at our company anymore. But I remember that. And I tried it the other way, Jason, where I tried saying like, I've got, the silver bullet. And people even said, Felipe, we know you have the silver bullets. You can kill the werewolf that's attacking this project. But I don't have the silver bullet. You have to meet people exactly where they are. I've learned it the hard way. I tried it once before. I went to a job and I thought I knew what they wanted. And I pushed something on them. And I was never invited back again. And it took me yeah. four years to repair the relationship with the project director so that we can start to work together again. Okay. So like I always tell people, like I learned that lesson the hard way and there is a time and a place. And I'd say like, if you're about to get hit by a bus, please put your hand down and stop the person from, you know, getting murdered, you know, by a bus buzzing down the highway. But I was like, well, most of what we do isn't that serious. Totally agree. So instead be curious. I bring a ton of enthusiasm. As you know, what I'm on, what I'm on sharing what we're doing, and I'm engaged with project teams, I am exactly like this with the people I work with every single day, whether it's the CEO, the CEO, the CFO, or somebody, you know, digging a ditch. I'm the same enthusiasm all the way up and down the chain because they're all part of the magic that makes buildings come to life and the projects for the owners that, that need these things to solve their business problems. So that's what I bring. Fantastic. And sometimes you have to like, you got to be quiet and just listen to people. 
but now it's not the time because you asked me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep. keep <laughs> on. And I was like, well, the- so I learned that, and and I you start to get better like when you practice adjacent because there is a sometimes, and we talk about this, and, and I I teach a three methodologies as well, and there's there's times where you have to like dictate the standard to people to get them repetitions and experience. So we create what I say we set up the environment so they can experiment, right? And it's like as the one controlling that. We can set the environment so that it's a safe, healthy place where they can actually experiment, make small failures and mistakes and learn. And then we very quickly say, no more templates, now iterate and make it your own. And these people have like taken off, like blown my mind, the amazing things that have happened. I've had many people because of this approach, Jason, have come to me and said, I was going to leave the construction industry. And it's because of these engagements and what we've done that I'm staying in and I love coming to work every day. And I was like, wow, that's, that's why. That's, that's why, why we do this. That's our why. Well, for that's me, why. it's a long for, answer, but no, that's the it, answer. it was fantastic. And I, I know we're out of time, but I'm glad we were able to, to cover that, that that's perfect. And just a little bit of quick feedback for you. It's, it might sound cheap because I'm directly on a podcast you know, interview with you, but the work you're doing, Felipe, is fantastic. Your approach is fantastic. The way you're able to connect and have the humility and connection and expertise all together. And uh, I just want you to know, uh, wherever you are, if you ever get uh, sad or whatever, just know that Jason's got his pom poms <laughs> like all the way over here in Phoenix rooting for you. Uh, thank you for everything you do. It, it's it's remarkable. Yeah, and likewise for you, Jason. You make me think and see things differently. And I 100% respect your approach. And we need people like you too, because you got to trailblaze. It's something different. And you know, you're going to interrupt and catch somebody in a certain way. And I'm going to interrupt and catch somebody. And we want the same thing. We want people to have fun doing what they do every day. And it's great work. Let's have more people come into our industry and join in this great work that it is. I love it. On we go. Let's do it. So with that, Jason, thank you so much for, for being on my show. It's been awesome to do this blended podcast. Yep. I, love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, they won't see the exact same thing because I'll use the latter part. But thank you very much, Felipe. It's been really fantastic. Very special thanks to my guest. I'm Felipe Engineer Manriquez. The EBFC show is created by Felipe and produced by a passion to build easier and better. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, everybody. Let's go build.